Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, session 3A in the Paleontological Association annual meeting. Um, I'm delighted to be able to bring you five talks from uh, early career researchers, all of whom are eligible for the talk prize, so hopefully you'll find it uh, entertaining. Um, just a few announcements before we get started. If you have any connection issues, uh, please can you click on the reconnect button at the top of the page. Um, so we're not expecting any problems, but if you do encounter any, then let us know. Uh, if you have any questions for the speaker, you can use the chat uh, bar on the right hand side of the screen to type these in. Um, please do start putting these into the chat uh, as soon as the speaker starts talking so we can ask them at the end if we have time. Um, and I think that's pretty much all you need to know. Uh, so without any further ado, I will introduce our first speaker in the session, who is Alan Bevan. So Alan, do you want to turn on your microphone and your audio? Great. Yeah, hi. Hi, Alan. And I'm going to just load up your slides. So Alan's going to tell us all about molecular clocks and divergence time estimates. So take it away, Alan. Yeah, hi, uh, um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, so I'm, I'm Alan, I'm from the University of Bristol, and I'm going to be talking about some recent work I've been doing using simulations to uh, explore uh, how total group, crown groups, and stem groups diversify. So um, as many of us know, estimating evolutionary timescales is a challenging prospect. Um, we know that uh, the first occurrence of a fossil um, from a clade means that the clade must predate this age, but by how much is debated. Um, so our molecular clock estimates of divergence times, um, which regularly predate the fossils by uh, some distance, feasible. And um, some recent work by um, Graham Bird and Richard Mann um, suggests they are not. So this paper came out earlier this year, um, and it has two main findings. These are that crown groups emerge shortly after total groups and that stem groups go extinct quickly after the emergence of the crown group. This has important implications because it means that where we see um, stem group fossils, we expect that the crown group shouldn't be uh, too far in the past from these fossils. Um, when stems are sort of demonstrably long, as in the case of angiosperms, they say that this must be caused by mass extinction events. So based on this, um, we, we, had, we had a little look at this paper and um, we noticed that for most of their analyses, um, the, quite a number of variables were fixed, including total group age and crown group age. Further, we noticed that all results were generalized based on 500,000 simulations. So we wanted to know what would happen if we relax some of these parameters and actually investigate the full distribution of um, divergence times. Thus, we have the following aims. So first, to describe the distribution of crown group ages when we have a fixed total group origin. Also to um, describe statistically the uh, extinction of stem groups after the crown group forms when we have a fixed total group and crown group origin. Then to uh, sort of flip the analysis on its head and maintain a fixed crown group uh, origin and estimate the um, um, uh, origin of total groups, and then finally to bring in um, some empirical uh, data and have a look at the divergence of uh, arthropods. So first we look at how the crown group emerges. So in the previous paper, they make a conclusion using an analysis that the crown group forms quickly after the total group. They then fix the crown group age for all of their subsequent analyses. So here we investigate the full range of the um, ground group pages that can be simulated in a birth death model in this way. So how do we do this? Um, we simulate a load of trees using this function, R function in the tree sim package. Uh, we use the following um, parameter values. So we keep our total group age at 500 million years. We have 0 0.5 extinctions per species per million years. We um, simulate trees with 10,000 tips and we use a speciation rate that is optimized so that 10,000 is the expected number of tips in that amount of time. The plot here shows the um, 
cumulative probability that the crown group has formed at time points between 500 and zero, uh, 500 being the start of the simulation. And you can see there's considerable variation there with 95% um, of crown groups forming between 357 and 900, and, sorry, 900, be crazy, and 497 million years old. Secondly, we look at the extinction of stem groups after um, crown groups form. So the previous paper um, makes the conclusion that stem groups go extinct um, shortly after the emergence of the crown group. And they do this by taking like the, the mean number of stem lineages at time points between 500 and zero. And uh, this has important implications as I've already uh, addressed. So we do things slightly differently in that we um, take all of our simulations individually and have a look at when the stem, stem group goes extinct in each of them. So to do this, we keep all of our parameter values the same as before, but instead of having a single, um, instead of estimating the crown group age, we have it in a series between our upper and lower 95% um, intervals. Um, figure A shows the cumulative probability that the stem group has gone extinct at time points between 500 and zero. Uh, and then B and C show the point at which 50% and 95% of the stem groups have gone extinct across all simulations. And D, although you can't really see it too well, shows the, um, the range between which 95% of the stem groups go extinct. So focusing on the black line and the points at 90, sorry, at 410 here, which is the um, crown group age that Bud and Mam derived. Um, we can see that 95% of the stem groups have gone extinct by uh, about 250 million years after the origin of the crown group. And considering that, that it's only a 500 million year uh, birth death process, that's quite a long time for the stem group to go extinct in, in those cases. Um, so for the third set of results, we uh, we sort of, as I say, flip the um, analysis around and we maintain a fixed crown group origin and estimate total group origins from this. To do this, we simulate coalescence events backwards in time, drawing waiting times from an exponential distribution based on the speciation rate. Um, and then each coalescent lineage that we simulate is uh, estimated to survive with probability given by this um, expression. Um, and then the, the, the youngest coalescent lineage that we simulate that survives to the present represents the age of the total group for this simulation. Uh, here are the results. Um, so our crown groups was, were always fixed at 410, although this value doesn't actually matter. Um, the results would be the same with any value. Uh, and then all the other parameters were as before. Um, focusing on the black line here, which is using those parameters that I described, um, we see that, that it's, it's, the total group ages are exponentially distributed. Um, so the bulk of the probability is, is close to the crown group, but then there's a really long tail. So we find actually that 95% intervals here were 412 to 754 million years. So there's considerable variation there. So just to summarize what I've said so far, um, the previous paper by Bud and Mann concludes that crown groups emerge shortly after total groups and that stem groups go extinct shortly after the crown group emerges. Um, we've shown that there's a lot of variation that's not been explored in that paper, um, which means that potentially those uh, observations are not necessarily true. And um, we've also analyzed the data in a different way to say that total group, uh, total group ages are simulated quite similarly. Um, so now to bring in some empirical data, um, we wanted to model a situation analogous to the evolution of euarthropods. So we did this because they're, they're considered an animal clade with a fantastic fossil record. And according to the sort of thesis of um, Bud and Man, it is an example of a clade that uh, it shouldn't have a long prehistory because of the presence of stem group fossils. But a lot of molecular clock studies suggest that it does have a long prehistory. So we simulated um, in the same way as previously, total group ages for the euarthropods. So our crown groups 
so our parameters had to be changed for this, obviously. So our current groups were fixed at 514, which is based off this fossil Yakaris, um, which is, I, I understand is the oldest uh, undisputed um, euarthropod, crown euarthropod fossil. We had our mutation rate set at 0 0.5 as before, and then our speciation rate was optimized to arrive at 7 million species in 535 million years, based on some conservative estimates from the literature. Um, I'd ask you to focus on the black line again, because the red line is using our parameters. Thanks. Um, so the, again, it, it, uh, the total groups are exponentially distributed. Um, and um, they, the 95% of them fall between 515 and 670 million years. So um, thinking about um, plot studies, which have looked at this, I personally can't think of any that have a 95% credibility interval that exceeds this, this limit, limit that we've suggested. So um, a higher null expectation of 670. Now that's not to say that the plots are correct, um, but we're just saying that these um, findings are in line with the null expectations based on these birth death models that we've implemented and have previously been implemented. Um, so just to conclude, um, the null expectations of crown and total group ages uh, are highly variable. And we also show that stem groups tend to go, extinct, um, go extinct in an unpredictable manner. And this depends on the diversity of the stem group when the crown group emerges. Um, we also show that simulations of euarthropods, uh, total group ages, are in line with molecular flock estimates. And based on this study and many others, um, the philosophy of, of the authors of this study are that if you want to derive um, divergence times, you should use Bayesian methods that incorporate um, linear specific rate variation and as many fossil calibrations as possible. Um, so I'd like to thank my um, Smiley co-authors there, uh, David Pisani and Phil, Dan Phil Donoghue, and my funders, I'm a BBSRC SW Bio student. Um, and thank you very much to the organizers for having me as well. Great, thanks very much. Very interesting talk. Um, so we've got a little bit of time for questions. I can see three in the chat so far. So the first question from Russell Garwood, uh, who says, sorry if I missed it. Uh, is extinction in your simulation stochastic? Uh, and if so, what impact might that have uh, or might have extinction events have on the patterns you resolve? Um, so, yeah, it, it, in, in my study, um, extinction is in, entirely just uh, under a constant rate of, of death, basically. So, yeah, completely stochastic. Um, based on the um, work from the paper that we've been looking at, uh, extinction events will tend to mean that basically larger clades can go extinct, if that makes sense. So um, so that might mean like longer stems as suggested by Bud and Man in angiosperms. Great, thank you. Uh, and we've got a question from William Foster, who says, are there any other groups of organisms that you think would be good case studies for your methods? Uh, anything with a good fossil record and some good understanding of um, like the origin of the crown group, I guess. Um, yeah, it, it, the myriad of other groups. Plenty of work to do then. Uh, Martin Escura says, hi, Alan, very nice talk. Have you tested how tree shape, asymmetric to more symmetric topologies affect the simulations? Uh, thanks, no. Um, so th these trees were just, were just simulated not to be any particular shape. Um, those trees exist somewhere in ones and zeros on the supercomputer here in Bristol. So I could potentially have a look at that, but it, it would be um, like, we, we wouldn't have simulated them that way. It would have just been a, a sort of effect we could look at afterwards. And then one final question from Jennifer Hoyle Cuthill, who says, fascinating talk, thanks. Could you please explain whether you use a different so model to push of the past or, or parameterize uh, conditionally on that? So we, we had a so we don't specifically look at um, push of the past, but um, in the sort of extended results in the paper, we do um, show that when clades are larger than expected, they are older, um, which is what push of the past predicts. And um, we don't we don't specifically. I'm not sure that push of the past is really a model. It's sort of a phenomenon.
that ought to happen under constant rates of birth and death. So I guess in that sense, there is push of the past in our data, but we haven't modeled it explicitly. Great. Well, maybe you can carry on the discussion in the chat. Yeah, That's another really question as well there. So thanks very much for that talk. Um, I'll bring up the slides for our next speaker now. Um, so Tom Smith, you've got, we've got Tom. Um, so please do take it away. Thanks, Imran. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom. I'm based at the University of Bristol, third year PhD. And today I'm going to be talking about how the tree shape of cladistic data sets can bias perceptions of morphological disparity. So cladistic data sets have become a mainstay of modern disparity analyses. The Starry Offering data set of Raven and Maidman is just one such example, published in 2017 and then repurposed in 2019 for a disparity analysis. Now, as I say, that's not the only example. Here are a selection of papers from the last 10, 20 years or so. It, now, despite their ubiquity in analyses of disparity, it's worth bearing in mind that the data sets analyzed here weren't assembled for the purpose of analyzing disparity. They weren't assembled for the purpose of distinguishing taxa based on dissimilarity. They were assembled based on uh, with the intention of grouping taxa based on morphological similarity. Now this begs the question, do the does this cladistic heritage, do the do the cladistic qualities of this data set bias uh, traits based perceptions of traits based occupation that are derived from them? as a consequence of being cladistic. Um, this is something that uh, hopefully uh, I'll explain a little bit more as we go on. So the way that we've distilled in our analyses, uh, the way that we have distilled the cladistic uh, qualities of the data set is, is through tree shape. Uh, and when I say tree shape, I mean the combination of topology and branch and distribution of a tree. But going forward, I'm going to be discussing topology uh, in uh, through, uh, discuss through describing tree symmetry. Uh, that is the degree to which the topology of a tree uh, divides uh, the tips into equal subsets. Uh, I've got a little graphic here which demonstrates uh, the differences between the two. If uh, if the tips are divided, uh, if all of the descendant tips of all the nodes in, the tr nodes in a tree are divided equally amongst all the descendant, the descendant lineages, then the tree can be described as symmetrical or balanced, as is the case with uh, subtree A. Uh, if not, as is the case with subtree B, you can describe it as asymmetrical. Um, I'll be discuss discussing branch length distribution uh, in terms of ultrametricity, i.e. whether a tree uh, has any variance in its root to tip distance. If not, it's ultrametric. Uh, if it does have some variance, then it's not ultrametric. And finally, I'll also be discussing um, branch length distribution in the terms of stemminess, which is simply the proportion of a tree that is made up by the internal branches, the branches that subtend nodes within a tree. If it's a high proportion, um, if the total branch, if it's a high proportion of the total branch length, the tree can be described as stemmy. If it's a low proportion, the tree can be described as leafy. Uh, now, why am I discussing tree shape? Well, there seems to be some evidence to suggest that tree shape compromises the performance of phylogenetic uh, reconstruction methods. Uh, the study of uh, Puttick and colleagues suggested that uh, asymmetric trees are more difficult to resolve accurately than symmetrical. And the work of Joe Keating and colleagues suggests that uh, leafier trees, trees with lower stemminess, are likewise more difficult to resolve uh, with phylogenetic methods. And of course, branch length distribution uh, is also the, the, the long history of the problem of long branch attraction and uh, how that impacts upon the efficacy of phylogenetic methods. And it's with this in mind that I'm asking a very simple question, what about analyses of trace space occupation? Does tree shape manifest in analyses of morphological disparity? If so, to what degree, what aspects of tree shape, and so on and so forth. So to do this, uh, to answer this question, we've uh, adopted a two-pronged approach. The first is to simulate data. Uh, we've done this by creating a series of generating trees that contrast in uh, specific aspects of tree shape. The first pair contrast in symmetry, the second pair contrast in ultrametricity, the third pair contrast in stemminess. We've simulated uh, discrete binary discrete character data along these trees uh, under an equal rates uh, MK model. Uh, all characters were simulated independently and were then concatenated into 32, 65, or 260 character matrices. A thousand of each were simulated for each of the generating trees, so that's 3,000 matrices per generating tree. And this is the simulated data that we've taken forward and conducted our analyses on. The empirical data we're using uh, was first curated by Tom Skiemi and Natalie Cooper a couple of years ago for their paper looking at the efficacy of time bidding methodologies. 
as you can see, the matrices vary in size and they also vary in tree shape, which gives us a good foundation to explore how uh, subsampling these data sets might impact upon uh, traits based occupation. Very quickly, uh, we've characterized morphological disparity in our analyses using, uh, by computing distance matrices using the Gower similarity coefficient followed by ordination through multi-dimensional scaling. Uh, trait space has been characterized using a series of indices to try and capture a bit more of the nuance. Uh, we've looked at uh, mean pairwise distance as a proxy for density um, with high values indicating low density. Uh, we've characterized the overall dispersal of taxa within trait space using the sum of variance and mean distance from centroid indices. And finally, we've, captured, we've tried to characterize the, the overall limits of trait space occupation exhibited by a clade uh, through the Summit Ranges Index. In terms of the analytical approaches, I'll describe these as we get through the results. So the first comparison I, to present here is the, that, uh, the comparison between the contrasting uh, generating trees, the data simulated uh, across contrasting generating trees. You've got the contrast in symmetry along the top row, contrasts in ultrametricity along the middle, and contrasts in stemminess along the bottom. If we start with density, which is the column furthest to the left, uh, you'll see that the asymmetrical the uh, ultrametric and the long leaf trees uh, produce data sets that have a much denser occupation of trait space. They're much more compact. There's a, uh, the mean pairwise distances are much, uh, are much smaller than their counterparts. And this uh, phenomenon carries over and is observed in the indices of dispersal, which are the middle two columns, where we see uh, the symmetrical and the non-ultrametric and the long stemmed uh, generating trees yielding matrices. Uh, with much higher dispersal than the counterparts. And finally, we see that uh, the overall limit of morpho space occupied, the greatest divergence between two points on each uh, dimension, in, on each axis, uh, is greater uh, for those matrices simulated along uh, asymmetrical, ultrametric, and long leaf tree generator trees, those with long external branches. Um, it's worth noting going forward that I'm only going to be uh, presenting the results of the 260 character matri uh, matrices, and that's simply because the relationships were consistent across all three uh, matrix sizes. Variance simply increased um, as characters, uh, character number decreased. The next set of analyses we conducted uh, were uh, attempts to replicate the effects we saw when the differences lay in the generating true tree. And the way we did this is we first pruned the uh, original generating tree in the case for topology, the symmetrical tree, down to 16 tips uh, in two ways, one to preserve symmetry and one to maximize asymmetry. We then uh, derived matching uh, matrices from the original simulated matrices uh, by matching up the 16 tip subtrees with the, the symmetrical data sets, characterized their trait space occupation, and then compare the distributions. Uh, and what you can see here is in terms of density and overall dispersal within trait space, whilst there's a great deal of variance in the smaller data sets, the subsampled trees, uh, we were able to replicate uh, the impact of topological symmetry on trait space occupation um, through subsampling. The sum of ranges index um, uh, collapsed under subsampling, which is to be expected given the volatility of the index to subsampling. We weren't able to achieve this um, through uh, subsampling the long leaf generating tree to increase and decrease stemminess. Um, whilst we were able to replicate the relationship somewhat through polarity, apologies for the figures here, it seems like they've uploaded um, transparently. There should be block colors that help differentiate them. Um, but the over, whilst the overall, well, the polarity of the relationship was replicable, the magnitude of the relationship observed when the difference lay in the generating tree uh, was not replicable, um, which suggests when I go to my summary slide that whilst in, there are clearly uh, impacts of having differences in topology and branch length distribution on trait space occupation in the generating tree, uh, the only bias that can really be introduced in a meaningful way under subsampling is that derived from topology. Now, moving on to the empirical analyses that we conducted, our aim here was to compare random deviations in disparity under subsampling to deviations uh, achieved through selective subsampling. Um, so the way we did that was create a distribution of uh, disparate deviations in disparity of 50% random subsamples, which is the Gaussian distribution you can see here, and then compare that to the deviation in disparity observed when uh, the data set was selectively subsampled for specific aspects of tree shape. And the number of, uh, thank you, the number of uh, random subsamples that either surpassed or were below 
in terms of were sorry were more positive or more negative in their deviation uh, was used to, to create a p value so in this case um, the p values for the majority of the subsamples would be non significant because the deviations fell within the range of the random subsamples but we would give we would assign uh, in this case, we assigned um, significant p-values to the symmetrical and the long-stem subsamples as a consequence of them falling outside the random distribution. Now, this table, apologies for presenting a table, I know it's taboo, um, but this table presents all the results of all the subsamples that we conducted across the four data sets. Um, the best way to digest this is to look at the colours. The blank squares represent non-significant deviations, the blue squares represent significant positive, and the red squares present significant negative. Um, one thing that will stand out immediately is that subsampling to manipulate steminus seems to introduce a more consistent um, uh, trend uh, bias in rate space occupation. Um, I should note as well that all of the uh, deviations accounted for differences in some edge length. So uh, when we didn't factor in differences in some edge length, um, the deviation, the p values which arrived were much, much less significant. Basically, uh, you don't see the differences that we're seeing here. Um, so, uh, subsamples um, derived to manipulate symmetry uh, were inconsistent, but this is to be expected given the um, starting the trees we started with. All of the empirical trees were normal empirical trees. They weren't extremely symmetrical or they weren't extremely asymmetrical. And as a consequence, whilst we could introduce a gradient, uh, it wasn't as strong as the gradient uh, that differentiated the simulated data sets. Uh, which contrasted in symmetry. So this suggests that whilst uh, topological symmetry can introduce a bias in trade space occupation, the gradient has to be quite a severe one. The inconsistency in the ultrametricity result is a little bit, uh, is not so readily explained, but after we conducted these analyses, it transpired that the subsampling for ultrametricity um, we're running out of time here, so we'll, <laughs> we're going to overdrive. Um, the subsampling for ultrametricity uh, also introduced uh, biases uh, uh, relationships between in, in between the subsamples and steminess. So uh, long story short, it appears that the correlations we got between ultrametricity and uh, trace space occupation might well be due to underlying variations in steminess that uh, were unfortunately unavoidable in our setup. So to very quickly wrap through our conclusions, it looks like tree shape does indeed bias perceptions of morphological disparity. Um, topological symmetry seems to introduce a weak bias uh, that is only really present when there are strong gradients. It's worth noting that subsampling frameworks such as disparity through time, which intensely subsample a data set, could well introduce this bias between time billions because as the, data set, as the subsamples decrease in size, the uh, likelihood for extreme differences in topology between time bins increases. Ultramatricity, there's no clear evidence uh, that ultramatricity introduces a bias outside of that introduced by un, uh, underlying variations in steminess. And finally, steminess imposes a stronger bias on trait space occupation. Whilst this isn't something that can be introduced through subsampling, so isn't likely to manifest in disparity through time analyses, unless you start accounting for differences in sub edge length, there is a chance that if you're comparing distinct data sets, if all else, all else being equal, the data set uh, with higher steminess will have a more dispersed uh, trait space uh, pattern of trait space occupation versus the more compact pattern of trait space occupation you'd observe in a long leaf data set. Uh, I'm going to leave it here, so I, I've got time to answer some questions, so I'm just going to, uh, ooh, we've got some duplicate slides. Uh, I'd like to just thank all my supervisors at Bristol Baylor for being a wonderful place to work when we can get in the building. Um, and yeah, very much. Any questions? Thanks, Tom, for rattling through the conclusions in particular. Yeah, apologies for that, uh, but that a bit too much. <laughs> I'm sure you can answer any other questions in the chat, but we've got one come through from Sam Giles already, who asks, how do your hypotheses and conclusions differ for a group that has a much more diverse and disparate stem than crown? Um, sorry, I'm just trying to, so do you mean that uh, differ for a group that's much more diverse and disparate stem than crown? So you're saying how the how that discrepancy, uh, how that's going to impact upon, so whether the, we've got the diversity locked in the stem or whether we've got it locked in the, the crown of the group. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, if there, would, there would be much of a difference with uh, if the diversity was locked in at the stem, um, that would suggest that a lot of the uh, the external branches would be relatively short. Um, therefore, that would tend to lean the uh, lean the analysis towards a more dis a, a, we'd have, we'd have a it would lead to a stem a tree, which would in turn suggest that the clay the tax would be more the, the clay would be more predisposed to a more dispersed occupation of trade space rather than a, a more compact one with long uh, 
uh, with, with highly divergent outliers. I realize I kind of <laughs> massacred that answer, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss it more in the chat. I like that word, STEMIA. Very nice. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any more questions. So I think we'll move on to the next speaker. I'll just bring up the slides now. It's Omar Rafael Regalado Fernandez. Omar, are you there? Great. We can see you. Can we hear you? Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Well, I will let you take it away in that case. Um, all right. So, hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in today. Um, uh, my talk is basically a summary of everything that I have done as part of my PhD. And all of this research is currently part of, a, of an in-prep paper that COVID has decided uh, will be published at some point next year. Um, basically, the project consisted in doing a massive literature review of the phylogenetic analysis and uh, comparative anatomy of early diverging sauropodomorphs to produce a super matrix. And what I'm going to be spending most time of this talk is going to be discussing the results. But if you're interested in the methods, please do get in touch. Um, so long story short, because it's very long, um, mat matrices are live pieces of information, although we're used to see them as supplementary static material in the at the end of a paper. Uh, what you can see here is how the, the story started as two independent matrices whose phylogenetic analysis produced different scenarios. Uh, and then another author comes and reassesses the characters and taxa and generates a new iteration of the previous matrix. Uh, in data science, this is called a transaction. And because each transaction is different, when attempting to merge the data, which is what I'm trying to do in this case, um, to produce a, a super matrix, each transaction needs to be analyzed individually. Um, the reason for choosing the super matrix over the super trees for this particular reason um, is because the transactions are different and the results can have accumulated error. And this error could have generated spurious clades. And the only way to identify if you have a spurious clades or not is to have a reference. And currently we don't have a reference for early diverging or podomorphs. Um, this represents the first stage of the revision of the literature. Um, uh, actually, there is more papers that should have been, that should have gone here, but that image, um, is still being made. Um, and what you can see here is a histogram that shows you all of the tags uh, that I have included. Um, uh, and we can see the amount of missing data per taxon. Um, after analyzing all of the characters for all of the transactions and checking for disagreements and errors, we got 150 taxa, and this includes mostly sauropodomorph dinosaurs, but there is also a sample of ornithischians, theropods, early diverging dinosaurs, coelosaurids, and other basal archosaurs. And what you can see here is that the blue-purple colors are more derived sauropodomorphs. They are closer to sauropods, and those are the ones who tend to be preserved as more scarce and fragmentary material. Um, then in terms of characters, um, I have compiled 734 characters that were used to produce the, matrix, the, the tree that I'm going to show you in a bit. And there is an average proportion of 60%, 62% of the data missing. This means that most of the characters can be scored to about 62% of the taxa sample. Um, the histogram here shows a little bit more than 734 characters because there is that lone pike on the near to the one position. And those represent the autapomorphies that were used for Bayesian analysis, but I'm not going to discuss the results of those ones in this talk. Um, and here is the here is the tree. Um, using TNT, uh, the new technology search found four MPTs with a length of 4,907 steps. And when plotted against the stratigraphic column, it is evident that the group must have must have undergone a very quick diversification. Um, and interestingly, this diversification occurred way before Pangea broke up. Um, the diversity of sauropodomorphs seems to be disconnected from vicarians when you go very down into the into the uh, late Triassic, whereas when you go on the middle Jurassic and you see at sauropods, vicarians becomes more predominant, explaining diversity of the groups in there. Um, so on to some of the results, which I think are 
pretty much interesting. Um, one of the interesting findings in this topology is the position of your raptor as a sauropodomorph. Um, bear in mind that early dinosaurs are pretty much morphologically similar. Um, so a more thorough revision of your raptor may yield that it is actually a theropod somewhere else in the tree. Um, but we can see at the very base of the tree that there are several changes in the forearm, the pelvic girdle, and the hand limb, pointing out to very early changes in locomotion. Um, and at this point, it is clear that very early these sauropodomorphs started as faunipores. Then we go on to Bagualosauria, which includes pretty much all of the unequivocal sauropodomorphs. And they have more typically sauropodomorph traits, such as the shape of the ilia and the shape of the femora. Um, but we can also see that several changes start to occur in the dentition for both the upper and lower jaws, and it is likely that we start seeing at this point changes to more omnivore diets. Um, what you can see here is how, uh, in terms of size, sauropodomorphs achieve a very large diversity on sizes that range from um, turkey size all the way to, to rhino size. And what it's interesting here is the appearance of a particular group, the Platysaurids. Um, Platysaurus and Raleia, which are pretty much amongst the largest uh, Platysaurians that we have found, um, are a start to originate here and achieve very large sizes quite rapidly. But there is still signs that there's probably bipedality rather than quadrupedality as the predominant mode of locomotion at this point. Um, <clears throat> and here what we can see is that the bowplan of Platysaurus is more easily identifiable. Uh, most of what we think plat is Platysaurus in Europe is probably going to be reassigned to new genera as the anatomy of Platysaurus is more studied. And after including brain case characters, something that is very interesting, the groups become more defined. Uh, moreover, several changes start to occur in the vertebral column and in this particular analysis, they are treated as more for functional units rather than as overall the vertebrae. So we try to map as many individual characters in the individual uh, in the different regions of the vertebrae. Um, towards the early Jurassic, we see a larger disparification. The body sizes are more diverse, but so are the locomotions. Uh, unlike previous scenarios where late Triassic sauropodomorphs led to early Jurassic sauropodomorphs, here it seems that all the groups of sauropodomorphs, sauropods included, evolved during the late Triassic and then diversified during the early Jurassic. Most of Platysaurians, however, seem to become extinct during the late Triassic, early Jurassic mass extinction. Um, here you can see some new smaller clades and they are named using nodes uh, that appear during the late Triassic. The synapomorphies are, uh, for all of the nodes, are distributed along the whole body, but they tend to concentrate in the forelimbs, pelvic girdle, and cervical vertebrae, suggesting changes in locomotion and probably feeding habits. Um, it seems that several groups were experimenting with quadrupedality as well, and this may suggest different ways to achieve it. This may explain why, when looking at gradual changes, it is not, point, not possible to pinpoint to sequential order in how this uh, quadrupedality was acquired. So we can see, for instance, here with uh, Cephapanosaurus and Gishosaurus that there might have started to be um, an experimentation with, with locomotion, uh, with a quadrupedalic locomotion that is different from the one observed in sauropods. Um, <clears throat> so then here, um, the quadrupedality seen in Ankisaurids is quite different from the quadrupedality seen in the previous node, and it is possible that Ankisaurids started off with facultative quadrupedality, and it is at this point when we start seeing changes in the hind limb. So we start to see actual modification in the hind limb, whereas in the previous cases, most of the changes are restricted to the forelimb. Um, the, um, Something that is interesting is that the early Jurassic diversity contrasts with the low diversity in the late Triassic, but this is probably just a fossil sampling bias. Um, more recent uh, research done in the late Triassic outcrops from Argentina and South Africa are yielding more sauropod-like dinosaurs from the late Triassic, which might start bridging the gap between sauropodomorphs and sauropods that we are seeing um, at, at this point. So, to further test the validity of these smaller clades, we perform a consistency analysis. 
We use the implied weighting feature in TNT, and what this does is that it penalizes the plesiomorphism and gives more weight to characters that appear more often as anapomorphies. How much weight we decide to add is given by a concavity function. Most of the clades, the ones I hover over in this presentation, are preserved using uh, several weighting criteria. When penalizing plesiomorphies, the most groups like uh, Ornithoscleida and Phytodinosauria appear, and this suggests that probably there are several cases of convergent evolution going on um, that might be affecting the topology, the early branch topology. Um, finally, we check the stratigraphic feed to see how much better our explanation fits the stratigraphic column than randomly generated trees. Because I only had four MP, uh, MPTs as a starting point, I generated 100 trees from resolving the polytomies in the strict consensus, and these generated more suboptimal trees, but also better trees. This is a better sampling of the tree space, and when comparing it with our 1,000 randomly generated trees, all measurements of fit suggest that uh, the MPTs are the MPTs that we have produced are better. <clears throat> So what seems to be going on in here? Um, so here is a map of all of the sauropodomorphs that have been found from the late Triassic. There is a couple of them missing that were published very recently. And there is also some miniatures of the plants, the, the diversity of plants that we have found for those particular outcrops. So in the late Triassic, it seems that all the morphotypes or ecotypes originated. Um, so we can see that all of the diversity of sauropodomorphs is already there by the late Triassic. Um, the second pulse of diversification coincides with the Carnian pluvial event. And interestingly, our analysis suggests that Niasasaurus is a sauropodomorph dinosaur, um, which would mean that this diversification either occurred earlier or that the age of the Sambian outcrops needs to be revisited. Um, species richness and morphological disparity are increasing during the late Triassic in several places, like in England and Brazil. Several morphotypes are present in the same outgroups. Species richness may be explained with anagenesis due to the dry, humid, cyclic conditions during the late Triassic, but this needs to be tested with detailed stratigraphy, although this seems to be the case in Germany. And also species rich richness could also be a result of niche partitioning. And this can be tested doing more detailed comparative biomechanics and modularity analysis to see if there are different herbivore diets and specializations to different types of plants. Uh, the dinosaur diversification event may have led to the replacement of other herbivore tetrapods by sauropodomorphs so the dominant uh, herbivore fauna. And towards the early Jurassic, we see more diversity in quadrupedality. Most of the early diverging sauropodomorphs disappear and this coincides with the biotic turnover in the flora that is reported in Gondwana and Laurasia. And the arid conditions of the Triassic changed to more warm and humid conditions of the Jurassic. So towards the end of the early Jurassic, only sauropods seem to have survived as they develop a less specialized herbivore diet than their the, the, I think we might have lost your audio there, Omar, or at least I have. Okay. I think we've lost the audio of the speaker, unfortunately. Um, but if we can't get it back, then perhaps you can answer Martin's question in the chat. Um, Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, great. Uh, I think, sorry about that, Omar, but I think maybe we'll wrap it up then if, in case there's only a couple of minutes left. Um, so perhaps you could, if you use the chat function on the right, type in an answer to Martin's question. So I'll just read it out for, for those who can't see. Um, so Martin asked, uh, I have seen several non-traditional results in your trees. It is interesting. How well has it supported the position of Saturn Saturnalia at the base of Sauritia and Nambialia as an... Oh, it's scrolling away from me. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that one. Herosaurian, respectively. Um, how many steps do you need to force their more traditional positions within sauropod and warfare? Um, so perhaps you can just type in the answer to that in the chat. Um, but thank you very much for that, Martin. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, thank you very much for that, Omar. Um, very interesting talk. And thanks to all the speakers in our session for a really nice and diverse set of talks. 
Um, we're going to take a 15 minute break now and we'll return uh, for the symposium, um, which will be on um, different or new ideas on old fossils, a symposium of early career paleontologists from around the world. Um, thanks to all our speakers and thanks to all the audience for participating and some really excellent questions. And we shall see you in 15 minutes. Thank you.